<laughs> push the button. Yes, we're live. Hi, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, where I am today, and 6 a.m. on Saturday in Germany. We're broadcasting live from Akron, Akron, Ohio. And Thousand Oaks, California. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we want to remind you that we changed time on November the 6th. We fall back. So consider that if you want to tune in to see us next week. Tonight's topic, uh, since I just flew here to Ohio from California, we're keeping it simple. We're going to talk about some terms and definitions. We'll be back in 8.3 seconds. Hang on. There we go. Words, every vocation, whatever, has their particular lingo to identify the group and help them communicate together. Tonight, we'll delve into some of the words and what they mean from the space exploration, science, and astronomy per perspective. Okay, and just on that note, um, Anthony is saying, looking forward to learning more about tonight's show. Yeah, you know, with tonight's show, good. I actually learned a few things here, um, just looking up some of these words with Pam. Um, and Scott says both cameras are looking good. Yeah, we. Thank you. Yeah, um, we've had some interesting issues coordinating with the two, but so good. So. Um, this is not, we don't have an extensive list. We want to know if there is a word or phrase that you've been wondering about, and we'll use the crowd to help, help us answer if we don't know the term ourselves. Or you'll see me look off screen as I Google the heck out of it. Um, <laughs> so, um, Pam created a, a page on her website, and oh. we're going to. Sure There's, that one more line. There's one more line. Uh, the idea was that anytime you are wondering about the meaning of something, uh, be sure to ask. Uh, that's what we're here. We're here for you and we want to help you. And yeah, I created a, a page on my website and it's just basically called glossary. Yeah, here. This is. Oops. And while these aren't strictly the definitions, you might find it in a dictionary or a science manual, they are an everyday spacer guide to beginning to understand these words or terms and sometimes phrases. This page will probably be in process for the foreseeable future. And anyone is welcome to help us fill in the blanks. If you have new terms, you have a better way to explain something than you know, I have on the page, that would be awesome. And I actually don't have these two terms um, that probably should be there. One is the waxing moon and one is a waning moon. So if, let's say you have a full moon and then the very next night, it's not quite as full. That is a waning moon. It's getting smaller. It's getting closer to new moon. If you have a waxing moon, it's getting more full. It's like tonight, it's a couple nights past uh, first quarter. So that is a waxing moon. Oh, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I, I have a term um, that's not on the list too. Um, California turn signal. I've been doing a lot of driving lately. That's not an astronomy related thing. No, but I've noticed California turn signal is apparently the brake lights. Okay. Worst, worst offender was brake lights for a quarter mile. Then he jerks into the turn lane and then turns on his turn signal. So, okay. That's so California. I'm, I'm going to talk about annual eclipse now. 
Okay. And actually, someday they will all be annular eclipses because right now the sun and the moon are at the perfect position so that we do get a, a total <laughs> eclipse. But at some point, the, the moon will always be appear to be smaller in the sky than the sun and will not, in fact, cover the sun fully. These are typically like a just kind of a ring, a bright ring of sun with a with the dark moon in front of it, that kind of thing. Uh, you want to take the next one, Jeff? Sure. And just hi, Cliff. Oh, hi. Hang on. And apogee. Um, basically, when an object in orbit like the moon around the Earth or a satellite is the most distant from the object it is orbiting. Or it's, or it's a game company. Oh, that's a book company, too. Or, yeah. So um, we looked up ascending node and descending node. Um, you want to share that image? Yeah, hang on. Thank yeah. you, Jeff. I'll watch the comments. So, so nice. There's there's, a there it is. So the so, idea so. is this is like the plane of the ecliptic. You know, a lot of a lot of the planets and the and the Earth and the Sun are kind of in this plate, but things like the Moon will break that plane. And I think the you know the, the image here demonstrates pretty well how it might be above the plane or kind of north of the galactic plane, um, and that's the ascending node. Is is that what you're getting out of that too, Jeff? Yeah. And then when it kind of comes back below the plane, and I don't think too many things do this. The moon will. In well, fact, anything, anything that goes above the plane will also go below the plane because it's just at an angle to the plane. Right. But what I'm talking about here is when I look in the um, farmer's almanac, it's generally associated with the moon. So, and that's the one that breaks right. on a regular basis, actually, because I think Pluto will too. Well, yeah, in, so all could, planets, in a small degree, but Pluto's really off. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, they don't really do that for the other planets or anything, though. Right. It's always with like the moon in this case. Right, yeah. Moon at ascending, moon at descending. Yep. Uh, but I think Pluto might, but of course, Pluto's orbit is quite long yeah um and just what well, since i'm here in the farmer's almanac there is a strangely enough there's a great astronomical glossary however they don't have ascending node or descending node i wonder if it's just not used very often you know it might be a I see all over this thing in symbols oh. The oh. um, the farmer's almanac uses these. Well, I created something. Yeah. So the sun is a circle with a dot. The moon yep. has three aspects: Mercury, kind of a Venus-looking thing with a, a curl over its head. Uh -huh. Earth is a circle with a plus sign in the middle. Mars. People know Mars quite a lot. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. They all have. There it is, ascending node and descending node in opposition. Oh, oh yeah, there's conjunction. Conjunction is a little circle with kind of a straight line going at an angle. So these show up in this book on every page, and I see ascending node and descending node quite a lot. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so just so you know, there's lots of interesting places to get. Yep. glossary type information yep. all right so you want to go so, with the next one jeff asterism is basically a, a visual star cluster that's part of a constellation but isn't a full constellation like actually orion is an asterism of the whole constellation i kind of think of constellations as you know if you look on a map and you see in the United States, you'll see states and they have borders. That's the whole constellation. Things like the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, you know, those are asterisms. Oh, the teapot, that's a very good one in, what is that, Sagittarius? Sagittarius. 
Uh, and of course, Scorpius has a really nice astro is asterism in the constellation, which like, again, it's got the borders like a, like a state does. Uh, but the stars are kind of like little cities within the state. And the asterism is some of those that kind of look like something. That's what I think of as an asterism. So. Okay. Yeah, you want you want to talk about the next one, Jeff? Sure. Have, Bailey's have you beads. Seen that? Have you no, seen I'm, that? I'm, Bailey's beads. The arc of bright spots seen during a total or annular eclipse of the sun. They're named for Francis Bailey, an English astronomer, who called attention to them after seeing them during an annular eclipse in uh, May 15th, 1836, just before the moon's disk covers the sun. The narrow crescent of the sun may be broken by, in several places by irregularities, mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon's disk. The resulting array of spots roughly resembles a string of beads. And is another, um, another case of the moon isn't a perfect sphere. Right like they used to think. I actually really enjoyed um, learning from Mike about how the blind will get a 3D map of the moon. And I'm like, that would be really cool for anyone to understand that it's very, it has a lot of dimension with the mountains and the valleys and, you know, the craters, you can kind of trace out the craters by feel. Even looking at it would be pretty cool, I think. Yep. Yeah. And all right, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Cliff just, yeah, it was mountains on the moon. Yep, yeah. So, a bolide, I bet some people out there know what a bolide is. Uh, yeah, have you seen anything like that, Jeff? Oh, yeah, we saw one together once while we were driving. Oh, were, were we together? I remember yeah. one in Ohio. Where, where was oh. the one with us? Um, I don't know. It was here, LA-ish. Oh, okay. And we I saw like one. a couple, couple of uh, observations oh, uh, here. No, you want me to do it? What's that? Facebook. Um, Cliff had a Facebook. Oh, crash. there was one above that. It's the yeah, mountains, mountains on the moon. moon. Yeah, I okay. showed that. You did okay. Because yeah, I'm looking over at the other glossary. Yeah. So, I'm yep. and and I just so you know, folks. I'm in Ohio with my laptop. It's fairly old and it's very, very slow. Yep. All right. And we so, finally got your internet connection working. So, yes, we are very blessed to have that much. All right. Brown dwarfs. I think you know more about that than I do, Jeff. You want to? Yeah. It's, that? um, well, they call it a failed star, but quite frankly, it's just on the spectrum. <laughs> If, if you think about it, um, basically you go from gas giant all the way up until something ignites. And there's a point where it hasn't flashed into fusion, can't sustain a fusion, but there's enough pressure that other kinds of reactions are happening and it makes it do, does make it hot, just doesn't make it star hot. So that's a brown dwarf. It's kind of yeah. a cold star. And you used a term that I I understand. I think that it doesn't completely describe what happens when so much material comes together and then there's this, um, you know, kind of argument, I guess, between the pressure of it and, you know, pushing out from, gra right. well, gravity pulls in and pressures push out. I think that's how it goes. And it's yep. fusion. So yep. you said... Well, the fusion produces heat, which pushes stuff out. And but there's what you not said was that it flashes. Did you say it flashes? No, it's, oh. there's not enough mass to flash into fu a sustainable fusion reaction. That's a funny term to me, but um, anyway. Basically, it's, it's what starts the fusion reaction. It's the start of the fusion reaction. Mm, they um, call it flash. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and kind of gives me the idea of something different, but right, yeah, okay, it's just basically the match is lit. Um, <laughs> this this yeah. one, you know, there's not enough mass to actually light that match, but there's enough gravity and heat from the pressure 
that it does produce some heat. And there's probably there's probably a little bit of fusion going on there, you know, because there's a, there is some pressure, but not enough to sustain. So, and this is not like a white dwarf, which is kind of the end of a life. Right. That's what's star. left. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's left. Right. It's kind of kind and, of dead. But and a white dwarf isn't actually producing any energy. It's oh. radiating a bunch of energy that's in it. But there's so much, there's so much energy that it takes a very, very, very long time to to run out. Mm. And uh, red dwarf is that just a show, or is there an actual red, red dwarf? Hey, I think it's yeah, red, red dwarf. Red dwarf is the next step up from brown dwarf. The brown the dwarf. Red dwarf okay. The red dwarf is there's just enough pressure to light the match. To kind of glow, huh? Right. But there's not enough mass. And that's why even though red dwarfs last the longest, because there's not there's not the pressure that causes them to really burn through their stuff like you would get with a supergiant. Oddly enough, the most massive stars burn the fastest because there's so much pressure that they're just burning through their stuff really fast. A red dwarf, um, and we did what's a star, so we, we yeah, had sli and then and they go off. through a sequence of red. Right. Yeah, a red dwarf doesn't actually have a sequence. It just goes there until it run, runs out of everything. Um, but the average lifespan of a red oh, dwarf. Interesting. Okay. Well, it must have. Well, well, the average um, lifespan of a red dwarf is like something like ten times the current life of the universe. So well, it does go through a process to get to the point, right? Right. I mean, it may not yeah. burn through things the same way, but it, right. it gets enough okay. enough gases collected to actually light up. Um, and people were thinking that a red dwarf would be the <coughs> perfect place to look for a planet with life because it's been there a long time and there'd be a lot of chance for a long time for life to potentially develop. The trouble with a red That's dwarf. Yeah, it's not going to be a lot of light, is it? It's not going to be very well, potent, very powerful. Well, the Goldilocks zone would just be closer. That's all. Um, Got it. Yeah. But the trouble is, is that since there's not enough, there's not as much mass in a red dwarf, it's basically not held together as strongly as a larger star. How about so the gravitational like pull on the planets that might be around it? No, no, that's that's the same because it's mass is mass, but it's just that it's it's maybe call it fluffier. The outer can basically, you know, you know, you see a solar prominence. Red dwarfs do that a lot because there's nothing really holding stuff down a lot. You know, it's it's not being held down as much, so it's it's continuously throwing off stuff, and they're thinking that. Um, that it'd be hard to develop life when there's extinction level events every, you know, every few centuries. Unless they've developed, well, of course yeah, you have to exactly. around and have to develop the ways to protect from that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're, they're thinking that red dwarf, you know, if we want a colony around a star, that's eh, probably not a good place. Um, I know you get into a lot of these forums and have yeah. very, you know, deep in conversations depth, yeah. about you know, all mm -hmm. these different things. I don't do that as much. Yeah. Well, in fact, the best place to put a colony is around a white dwarf. Yeah. You just have to, you just have to surround it with solid diamond. Okay. Because solid diamond would convert the x-rays that white dwarfs produce a lot of into visible light. Ah, okay. Yeah, it just it, it'd be a long term project. Yes. So we and we talk about conjunction a whole lot. Yeah. And that's this, on yeah, and this typically refers to two celestial bodies that kind of like like tonight, I think, is the conjunction of the moon and Jupiter. I saw it out here. It's it's been amazingly clear here, Jeff. I mean yeah. four or five nights is like wow. 
This is like some of the good nights in California. Um, but I, but I, I think it, it's about a degree of each other is what they usually talk about. Right. Yeah. Um, but but I, I'm looking tonight at the moon and it, it, it seems like it's more than a degree away from Jupiter. And, and one of the ways you can do it is to look at your pinky finger at a distance and, and cover up whatever it is. And, you know, and that's yeah, it's about it's a degree. at arm's length. Yeah. Your pinky finger at arm's length. Right. Yes. Right. Corona, not just and the beer. Yeah, and and it's interesting that you know you've you did a show showing the various um, things like you know how how wide things are depending yeah. according to your hand, and yeah. it's amazing how proportionally people's yep. hands at arm's length are about the same width visually, yeah. no matter how tall they are. So that's yeah. just. You, you know, I actually used it tonight because I we went somewhere, got out of the car, and there were sun dogs. And very often, mm -hmm. sun dogs are about 20 degrees from the sun. Mm -hmm. But these were, you know, I, I put my arm out, and I was like, the whole width of my hand. So that's about 25 degrees. So it was very interesting to me that that would be in a somewhat different, you know, place from mm -hmm. the sun. I guess we should probably talk about sun dogs too, huh? <laughs> I don't think it's on this list. I better, I better update my list. Well, since you're talking about it now, why don't you just give the definition to it? I'm not sure what the definition is, but I can tell you what it is. Um, so this is a phenomenon in the sky when the sun is generally setting or rising. It's not high up generally. Uh, and sometimes these are just amazing and complex, but the sun dog itself is a very, a fairly simple thing. You have enough cloud cover that you're going to get ice crystals at some degree away from the sun that will give you something of a rainbow. I actually pointed this out to a fellow who was a lot, a lot older than I am. He couldn't, he couldn't see it. He couldn't distinguish it. Sometimes they're very, very bright. I also know that when you wear like an amber you know, lens sun, sunglasses, they kind of pop out better. Um, so yeah, and you may have seen sort of a, a full circle of them and maybe kind of at the top, but mostly the sun dogs are themselves are at the sides of the sun, sometimes both, sometimes one, sometimes the other. And then you have other things that play into that, um, you know, the whole circle, the whole arc. Uh, yeah. And I forget all the names, uh, but there, there's some really good stuff out there about, um, you know, the arcs and the crowns and glories and sun dogs. And you can even get moon dogs, which is the same effect with the moon. Yep. So that's okay. a lot of on our page. Um, constellations. Well, okay. It's a group of stars that some Greeks who were on drugs decided looked like something. <laughs> Well, that's the asterism. To me, the stars in a constellation are the whole, the the entire right. you know, state's worth of stars, so to speak. And we actually didn't talk about Corona. I said it wasn't a beer, but um, oh. we got off on a tangent. Corona, Corona, that's the that's a, that's a layer of the the sun, right? Right. Yeah. It's kind of think of it as the atmosphere of the sun, although that's really a bad way of putting it. But yeah. the corona is actually temperature-wise hotter than the sun itself. Yeah, and that's um. Uh, although it's so so diffuse that it won't heat you up very as much as you know as the sun would. So, um, just you know, temperature versus heat there. And here we are at descending node because I put these in alphabetical order, of course. Yeah. And we kind of covered and, that. Already. And there it is, and it's the point at which a orbit crosses the ecliptic plane going south. It's yeah, kind of the opposite I, of the ascending node. Yeah, I enjoyed finding the two different because that one had a nice picture, and this has a definition, which is which is really a good good way to contrast things too. I think. Yeah, and it also points out that ascending node is um, going north. You know going above the plane of the ecliptic and yeah. um, the node itself is the point where an orbit crosses a plane. 
Yes. Right. So as the moon comes above that, it, it hits a point, and that's, yeah, that's the node. Mm -hmm. All right. So what else is here? Exoplanets. Boy, there's been a, a lot of development with planets that are outside of our solar system. And I think that's what the exoplanets are, right, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, basically any planet that's not around our sun. I think theoretically, even a free-floating planet that got flung out from a solar system is technically an exoplanet, although we'd call it a rogue planet. But, you know, technically it's an, because it doesn't orbit our sun, therefore it's an exoplanet. Right. And a rogue planet means it just doesn't orbit any sun. It's kind of wandering around. Well, like a lot of the possible, one of the theories is that a bunch of potential planets or planets that were in our solar system actually got kicked out by Jupiter. Oh, yeah, right. Because of the gravitational yeah. forces. When, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, uh, my guess is that there's probably a number of exo of rogue planets out there produced by any solar system that actually developed planets. Yeah, I love how they're able to deduce that, you know, Jupiter did this moving within our solar system and, and did some interesting things to the other planets. Mostly it's a gravitational thing, right? Right, yeah, and basically cleared out a bunch of stuff, too. Um, you know, they're saying that it's why there's an asteroid belt where it is. It's why Mars didn't get bigger than it is, because Jupiter basically got close enough to kick out a bunch of stuff that would have impacted Mars. Um, ah, okay. Okay, well, we, we I think a lot of people know what a full moon is. Yep. Uh, basically when the sun reflects off you know the half of the globe that we can see at that particular time yeah it's when the moon is essentially behind the earth from the sun but not yeah. exactly behind right um, that would be an eclipse <laughs> yeah so okay. yeah Galaxy. galaxies yeah um it's basically groups of stars in the hundreds basically, of billions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically gravity gravitationally bound is is essentially what the technical definition. It's a group of gravitationally bound stars. You know, it's kind of fascinating because uh, and I think I told you this, Jeff, that we had um uh I think it's Dr. Shapiro had a really nice demonstration of this um and to me, it really helped understand this mass anomaly that we have because the galaxies actually look like they do with the, you know, the different spiral arms uh, because of the mass anomaly. He, he, he had this, this bowl full of something kind of gelatin like and put a straight drop of ink across and then he twisted the interior of it and it started forming these kind of arm looking things. And, you know, without the mass that there is in the galaxy, I wonder if our galaxies would look like this because, you know, there is this mass and they, a lot of people say dark matter. Uh, to me, it, that's a bit of a misnomer because it's, it's something we don't know what it is. Well, I say mass anomaly. Well, th that's what they, um, dark in map making means you don't know what's there. And that's why they use okay. the term dark matter. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, you know, dark matter, dark energy just basically means they don't know what it is. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I don't care for the term that much, but, you know, that's no. just me. Um, but it was just fascinating to, to see this bowl of this very viscous liquid that and yeah. I don't even know what it was. And they, he drew the straight line of ink turn the interior of it and you get this you start getting this kind of arm of a galaxy looking thing just fascinating yeah. it, it was uh what was that uh, fluid dynamics yeah. he talked about fluid dynamics yeah so, you, so you the galaxies what? are kind of in a fluid they're kind of yeah. a fluid dynamics example yeah. Yeah. yeah you know a better term for dark matter <laughs> god what stuff that has to exist to make our equations work oh okay <laughs> That's that's what dark matter is essentially, because they needed something to make their equations work. Yes, it's true. Well, and the, that happens a lot, actually. Yep. 
All right. Do we want to talk about the groups, clusters, all that stuff next? Um, well, a cluster is a bunch of galaxies that are gravitationally yeah. bound. I mean, um, I mean, the universe is expanding, so most stuff is heading away from us. However, most. yeah. However, some some galaxies are actually heading toward us, Andromeda, which is going to hit us in, yeah. in a few billion years. Um, it's our local cluster. It's uh, right. The, it's part of our Mag local cluster. Yeah. Magellanic cloud, I believe, is the name, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, the Magellanic, yeah. And there's a number of small, you know, mini galaxies that actually orbit us. But yeah, there is a, we are part of a cluster that is kind of, they're all, you know, roaming around each other. You know, the center of mass, there isn't anything in the center that we know of. Um, that kind of but, makes me think of rising bread, how it gets the, the kind of gaps in it and all those yeah. kind of tendrils. And when you look at the, the huge maps they've made of the galaxies. It mm -hmm. kind of looks like that too, doesn't it? With kind of bubbles in it. Right. Yeah. And the galaxies are where the bread is. Right. But some, um, of, some of that's kind of coming together as opposed to. Right. Expanding. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What do we have next? Oh, greatest Eastern elongation, greatest Western elongation. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is going to be a doozy. Uh, I hear about this mostly in relation to Mercury and Venus. So, of course, we have like the sun and then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on. And the planets that are toward the sun are the inferior planets. The planet from, you know, in, in, toward the sun from Earth are the inferior planets and the ones that are away from the earth are called the superior planets, right? Uh -huh. So we're going to see in the sky, Mercury and Venus only, you know, close to the sunrise or the sunset. They'll never be in the top of the sky. We might be in trouble if, if you see them there. <laughs> so at some point they kind of climb and then they, they kind of pause there and then they come back. So that's the greatest elongation point. Now, if it's west of the sun, <laughs> it's called greatest western elongation. However, it's, it's rising the east. And if it's east of the sun, as the sun sets, it will appear in the west. That's the greatest eastern elongation because it's east of the sun itself. Very confusing for me for quite a long time. I just had to kind of think of it as being one side or the other of the sun itself. And then you kind of visualize where it's going to be as the sun moves. I hope that helps. I should make it much more concise and write it up in this glossary. Yeah. What else do we have? Um, lunar eclipse, although we pretty much hit on that it's when the moon goes behind the earth exactly and the earth it gets in earth's shadow and interestingly enough there's actually two kind of areas one's a penumbra and one's the umbra and so that's why the moon looks kind of different colors during some of these eclipses you know oh hey cliff's got something uh, this is coming down so slow i will have to watch later yeah. Yep. We had a lot of issues before too, Cliff. Oh, let's flash that for everybody. Yeah. Cliff's, Cliff's having some trouble with yep. Oh, and I can't even do it. There it is. Great. Uh, well, yeah, please feel free to watch the show later. Absolutely. Yep. Wow. I clicked that button. It's taken forever. Okay. What else do we have? Nebula. Uh, <laughs> yep. I like Nebula. Yeah. Uh, most nebula is basically the corpse of a star. Essentially, star blows up, and it's it's gases and the stuff that it produces are floating. Now there are some that are produced by stars that haven't blown themselves up. There, um, well, but there's like a layer like, blows off. A layer blows off, and I think a reflection star. nebula is a bunch of dust, isn't it? Right, but it's generally from an exploded star. 
Oh, it is. It's um, still okay. It's um, not just ambient dust. Right. There um, are some. There are some dust patches, like, um, you know, the coal patch nebula is essentially a dust dust patch, and those might be from the be beginnings of the of the galaxy. Um, oh, interesting. Those those are generally dark and you know fairly opaque. So uh, the Pleiades, I looked it up once, and it's like a reflection nebula, and a there's like five different things included with this one nebula. That mm -hmm. is like wow. Yeah, and yeah, a nebula that's lit by another star is often called a reflection nebula because it's and it's not always light bouncing off of it. Sometimes they, it fluoresces from the light from a star. So it actually, yeah, yeah. We got new like, moon. Yeah. When the moon is between the sun and the earth, and it can't actually be seen from earth because the side facing earth is in shadow. And that's another condition of having an eclipse. Yeah. That's yeah. A total, that can be a total solar eclipse, an annular eclipse, a partial eclipse of the sun. Right. Boy, right. lots of different terms for, for similar things, huh? Yeah, and, and you can sometimes see the moon when it's a new moon, because the Earth, um, if it's early enough or late enough in the morning or real early enough in the evening, you can get reflection off of the Earth onto the moon. Yep. Well, Cliff is able to join us again with, uh, when is your daylight savings time? Yeah, we do that on Sunday and we fall back. So yeah. when it would have normally been nine o'clock, it would be eight o'clock. So let's see, Cliff, you're going to want to show up an hour early for the show. Right, Jeff? I think so. I think so, too. I have to work it out every time. I don't remember. But essentially, Cliff, it happens in two days here. So it'll be for the next the next show. The next show. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. yeah thanks for asking. Alrighty, what else do we have? Um, opposition um, refers to a planet in the solar system on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. Um, um, could be any two ast astronomical objects, though, and tends to be the best time to view and photograph planets like Saturn because, of course, it's reflecting the most sunlight because and, you know and kind of closest approach in a way too. Um, yeah, it depends if if they're highly ecliptic orbits, then it might not be. But yeah, if it's fairly circular, yeah, it's closest approach because we're on the same side of the sun as it. Right. Yeah. So the sequence is Earth, Sun, Earth, whatever is at opposition. Yep. And we 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 see them well once a year. You know, we'll get all of them at some point in the Earth's orbit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, individual. Oh, path of totality. And we see a lot of charts like this because, of course, you know, when there's a total solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, there's kind of like this footprint on the Earth. And that's the, the path. Well, the, the path of totality is like the very most time that it's like, in, you know, total solar eclipse is eclipsed. Yeah, basically. It's where you can see the total solar eclipse on the Earth. Well, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the very best. Yep. Whoops. I we, I lost your audio, Pam. Whoops. Yeah. Um, just so you know, folks, um, Pam has been figuring out um, her. Um, Pam has been figuring out her internet connection there, and it's good sometimes and bad sometimes and it looks like we lost her completely so um daniel tweed what is occupy mars it, people basically it's a group of people who are promoting setting up a moon a mars base which i think is premature because i think we need a moon base first but hey um oh, it is Pam. Ah. 
it gave me the boot. Nope, I did not. Your your own connection gave you the boot. That's what I'm saying. It gave me the boot. Ah, okay. Yeah, my internet connection here gave me the boot. I booted ah, okay. me out. Yep. I see another. I, um, I see another comment. Yeah, I I covered it. Um, Daniel asked, "What's what about Occupy Mars?" It's not actually an astronomy term. It's just a term for people who want to colonize Mars. Yeah. Um, basically, the term became popular after Occupy Wall Street. And, you know, Occupy this, Occupy that. Okay. They jumped on that bandwagon. Um, Thanks for asking, though, Daniel. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not a bad thing. I think we do need a colony on Mars. I just think we need one on the moon first. But um, It'd be a good place to cut our teeth for that sort of thing. And produce the materials to head over there. But um, While I was okay. away, did you cover? No. Um, I was just about to hit perigee, but I was, you know, talking on um, Daniel's question. So, perigee. When an object in orbit, like the moon around the Earth, is at is the close to the um, object it is or orbiting, so basically the opposite of apogee. Right, apogee you know, farthest, perigee closest. Yeah. So if the um, if it's you know like an oval or you know eclipse or ellipse, um, Earth will be here, and you'll have the um, the near part and the far part. This is perigee. This is apogee. Yep. Or the no, other way around. But oh, yeah. Well, ap apo is from apex. Like yeah. the apex yeah. okay. of the yeah. mountain is the top of the mountain. Yeah. Yep. The highest point, the farthest away. Yep. Cool. All right. Okay. Uh, you know, this is an interesting definition, planetary trio. I will try to cover this, um, but I found out about it from, do I have a, I think I have some, yeah, earthsky.org. I had not heard it before, but uh, it's three planets fitting within this um, five five degrees, apparently. So remember we had the conjunction before, and it's kind of like one degree apart, um, but it's, in practice, it's not exactly always one degree apart. Yeah. Oh, we're losing your audio again a little bit, Pam. Okay, so one of the examples would be times when I'm giving what's in the night sky and I say the moon and this are in conjunction and the moon and that are in conjunction. Um, you know, that's two planets being near each other because they have to be within one degree of the moon for them to be in conjunction. Um, right, yeah. But this, yeah. but this is planets. So basically if we ever see... Um, if we ever see three in conjunction with the moon, then you know that you've got a planetary trio also. Yeah, it, it's a term I hadn't, I, I don't really see it very often. So, but if you run across it, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. I don't think it happens a lot. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it certainly was one of the things that happened when, um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the story of Jesus coming to uh, Jerusalem mm -hmm. and they yep. followed a star. Well, that was a kind of a super conjunction of planets. And I don't remember how many they were. They were kind of lined up. And so it yeah, appeared to be a very, very bright beacon in the sky. I think it was Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. I, yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah. And that, uh -huh. those have been like super close too. that's. Yeah. That's incredibly rare, I'm sure. Yeah. Solar okay. system. Yep. Or are it's, we getting tired? <laughs> no, we're, we're close to done. Um, yeah. Solar system is actually, astronomers don't like the term. Oh, really? Solar, I didn't know that. Well, because solar system is only ours. When people use the term solar system to refer to stars with other planets around them, Exoplanet those are planetary yeah, planetary systems, because solar system comes from Sol, which is the name for the sun. So that's um, that's why 
ours is a solar system. Yeah. Yeah. Cliff, I hadn't heard of a planetary trio either. Um, but someone coined the term for it. So there it is. Um, so Pam, are you back? Can, can you hear me? I, I can hear you fine. Can you hear oh, me? Yeah. I just lost you for a little bit. Um, you want to go on to the next one, Pam? Oh, no, we lost her. Okay. So solstice. There is one in June and one in December. It's when the sun reaches its highest position in the sky, it will be directly over one of the tropics, Tropic of Cancer in the north, Tropic of Capricorn in the south, which defines the first day of the new season, switching to summer or winter, depending on which hemisphere of Earth you're on. So, um, star party, gathering of amateur astronomers and others for the purpose of observing the night, in the night sky naked eye with binoculars and with telescopes. The only party you are encouraged to crash. Well, okay. And of course, Pam has that on there because she runs star parties. Um, Scott. Yeah, I, Scott, I'm learning things that I did not know that I did not know. Yep. Um, that's the best kind of thing because then you can go and you have new things to look up. Stars. Well, I kind of think we all know what those are. The sun is one. Most of the bright lights out there that don't move a lot are stars at night. Um, star clusters. Again, clusters of stars. Um, you can think of them as mini galaxies, although not really. Um, summer solstice. Well, yeah, it's the solstice that's in summer. The sun, the nearest star to Earth. Total, total solar eclipse. These are all things that, I mean, almost everyone knows, but all a beautiful phenomenon viewed from Earth. Yeah, where the moon's blocking the light of the sun. And you have to be really lucky to be, or have a good travel budget to be where a solar eclipse is because they don't cover a huge amount of territory. Um, Daniel says, you should do a show about Galactic Greg's universal solar system habitats and colonization of Venus cloud tops first. Huh. Well, I'll look at, I'll look into that, Daniel. Um, yeah. Um, Having a floating habitat in Venus would not be a terrible idea, except that there might not be a reason to be there except to be there. Uh, because it's not like you can mine anything from there. I don't know that you'd be able to get any resources um, from that that you couldn't get easier somewhere else. But, you know, to do it, to, just to do it, sure. Oh, hey, Pam's back. I thought I wasn't going to make it back. Yeah. So I basically um, blew through the rest of the list because they're all fairly common terms. And so I just. And, and you did know. you tell Daniel that we invited Greg to the show? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. We invited Greg to the show. Of course, he is also on the East time zone, Eastern time zone. And right now I'm. Whoops. Uh, we lost you again, Pam. Um, yeah, she's. We, we have to figure out her a better internet connection for her. Um, so Daniel says it's closer than Mars. Yes, it is. But Mars, you can get to the ground and mine stuff off of. Um, oh, you back? Yeah, maybe she's back. I feel like a yo-yo. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, Daniel's talking about, um, habitat on, you know, cloud floating tabs on, in Venus, um, and it's closer than Mars. Yeah. But we'd have to figure out some, some way of making money or getting mean resources from that. I think for anyone to care enough to do it. And, uh, Scott, I'm really excited that you learned things that you didn't know you didn't know. Also, um, it's Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer. Cancer. And I'm very sorry. It's almost 1 a.m. here. I'm 
feel a little bit jet lagged still. And uh, <clears throat> this internet's giving me <laughs> crazy making. <laughs> yep. All right. What okay. Else we um, Cliff says we have an area named the Capricorn Coast near a city called Rockhampton, as it's on the latitude. Okay. Oh, didn't know that. Interesting. Yep. Uh, and one more from Daniel. Dan says, Pam sounds mellow from good traveling. <laughs> mellow from no <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pam sounded like she has jet lag, I think. Oh, yeah. Seriously. Um, let's see. You got through the glossary? Yes. All so. right. Let's not do the chart. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, you you're might... What's that? Yeah. So let's go to some stellar events this week. I'll stay here as um, long as I can. Yep. November 4th. Oh, here we go. Must be Starlink stealing the bandwidth. <laughs> um, November 4th through November 11th. Um, November 4th, Jupiter and the moon are in conjunction. And Neptune and the, and the moon are in conjunction. And we lost Pam again. Um, November 6th, um, time change. Um, in the USA, fall back. Um, November 8th, full beaver moon and an eclipse. I, I'm not the one who names these folks. Um, and Uranus and the moon are in conjunction. I am really not the one who names these. Um, and Mercury is in superior conjunction. So, um, whoops, she might be back again. Maybe. Um, November 9th, weekly space hangout. Um, untying an early cosmic knot with Dr. Andre Vayner. And Uranus is in opposition. There it is, opposition. Yep. Um, November 11th is Veterans Day in the U.S. And Mars and the Moon are in conjunction. Um, also on the 11th, uh, Friday night show. And I'm going to be doing moon-based design. Find us Fridays at 9 p.m. Pacific time on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page and the Everyday Spacer YouTube channel. Do we want to do other events and activities or? We have talked about them a very lot, but you know what? The one I want to talk about, the one I want to make sure I mention again, let me find it. It's tomorrow, the 12th. Ah. The symposium, the free online space symposium hosted oh, by uh, Human Space Program. That's spaceeducation.squarespace.com, Jeff. There is yeah. a banner for it. Yeah, and we've yeah. talked about all the other ones a lot. So, but this one's happened to be tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Oh, actually, the one is over with. It was, uh, it ended October 31st. So, oh, okay. Also, and Cliff has a comment of, yeah. What, yep. is, it, what, is, what is it? Yeah, he basically, he opened a, opened a can of worms, beaver, for, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so let's go on to, um, yeah, we're going to blow past a bunch of the events because we've covered them several weeks. Um, so if you or anyone you know has done something interesting and involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. Join us again next Friday, November 11th, and let's figure out a design for a moon base, where to put it, what it needs, and how big it should be, and anything else you can think of that really should be in the moon base. And maybe figure on phases. How big should the initial one be versus... How big should it be? You know, how big, what's the maximum size too, if you have an opinion on that. Um, so that's, that's next week. And I have and this some ideas. Has been, this has been real fun. I'm so sorry. I just keep dropping out and I come back when yep. I can. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Cliff. I, I look forward to having a discussion about it. Yeah. You know, I, I could potentially just 
have have an entire show of my opinions of it, but that's just one person, and I'm more interested in hearing your opinions than just spouting that. Oh yeah, off we mine. love to help you and demonstrate to you what's possible, and that's why that we bring the guests that we do. And uh, yeah, yep. any words out there? Any phrases you come across, and you're like, what? Uh, drop it in the chat. We'll help you out. We'll try and figure out what it means. And we usually have a really good crowd here. So lots of brain power. Check it out. Yep. Uh, let's say thanks to Daniel and Cliff and Anthony and Scott. Got and it. did I miss anybody? Um, I don't think. Oh, yeah, you got Anthony. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think you got everyone. Thanks so much for joining us, folks. I'm going to try to <laughs> when I can. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll keep working on getting her better internet connection, but she's only been there for a few days. So we, we got the best we could at the moment. Um, oh, yeah. And Cliff says, hope the internet is better next week. Yep. Oh, hey, David. The transmission is intermittent, guys. It is for us, too. So, so it's only been getting bits. Um, okay. Um, suggestions. Can we do a session on choosing scopes? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we did, but we can do another one because, oh, we had a couple of guests that that talked about choosing scopes. But, of course, that was just their opinion. So maybe we have one where we, you know, ask, the, ask you guys um, your opinions on choosing scopes, too, because everyone has their own opinions. And... Oh, I meant the moon base. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Cliff, of course, you want to talk about scopes so that you can buy them and ensure it rains over there. Um, oddly enough, we're, we're starting to be in our rainy season. And of course, here, rainy season at the moment means that I wake up in the morning and there's water and the pavement's wet. But well, We'll get to it. Okay. I think that's about it. We'll be here um, looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, I think that's it. We'll be here looking at comments for a bit. Um, but I'm pretty sure Pam's as tired as her internet connection right now. So. <laughs> We'll, we'll see you guys um, next week. Yeah, you want to hit the outro? Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>